This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Shirley Manson on February 8th, 2018 in Los Angeles, California for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so... I will acknowledge everyone who's here, Sophia and Michael. We are all so excited. <laughs> we're just... Oh, thank you so much. Um, so this is a, a full personal and professional biography. Um, so we start way at the beginning. Um, can you talk a bit about where you grew up and your family of origin, parents, siblings? I grew up, I was born and grew up in Edinburgh, Scotland um, in 1966. I was a 60s baby, raised into the 70s by my parents. My father was a university professor. Um, my mum was a, a, essentially a housewife. Um, a term that's thankfully gone by the wayside, but back then she was a housewife. And I had two siblings, um, two sisters. I was the middle child, um, which has had a massive bearing on my personality. Um, and yeah, I grew up in, in essentially a middle class family, really loving parents, got along with my sisters, um, went to a great school, um, government funded school. Um, again, back then in the 70s, you know, the British government put a lot of money into education, so I was really lucky. I went to some really good schools. Mm. Um, my high school had a separate music department um, and recording studio, and I think uh, I also benefited from that. And my mum was an amateur singer. She sang with a um, local swing band called the Squadronaires. And uh, yeah, just music was always a huge part of, of our, our growing up. And my mum used to play records and I played in the school orchestra and I sang in a choir and I was selected by my school to study violin and piano and clarinet. And yeah, so I had a pretty full musical upbringing. Yeah, I was, well, when I was doing research, uh, I have it seems to be it seems to have been very well rounded. You played it recorder, clarinet, fiddle, just said violin. You were a brownie. You were involved in drama. I was a brownie guide, man. Yeah. Um, was that? So I think you kind of answered the the question, but creativity was something that was encouraged in your in your household. Was all that like self directed, or did your parents um, kind of say, "Oh, you should be involved in all these things and play music and do drama"? No. Music was just something for fun in my household. It wasn't ever considered a career in any way, shape or form. And I certainly wasn't really overly encouraged by my parents in any way. Um, I just had a natural inclination towards music. But my dad wanted me to go to university. That was what he was interested in. I had a much more academic sort of upbringing in some ways than I did a creative one. I didn't really even know what creativity was until much later on in my life. I mean, I'm talking like into my late 30s, early 40s. I didn't really understand what being a creative was. I know that sounds weird, but, you know, I came from a really straight upbringing, like really sort of, you know, my parents loved each other. They got along. They didn't argue. I didn't see anything weird, you know. I mean, I couldn't have had a more straight upbringing. And my mum wore an apron, you know, and like, you know, warmed our pajamas on the stove in the morning. I mean, it was like sort of blessed upbringing. Um, and I had a really powerful matriarchal figure in my life. My father's mum was essentially a single mum. She lost her husband when she was really young and raised her kids by herself. And she was also an academic. She was um, double honours uh, graduate of university and, you know, for a woman who was born in 1901 to go to university and get a double degree was really practically unheard of. Mm. And so, yeah, I was more pushed into academia, which I balked against. And yeah, I just sort of fumbled into music really in a way. Um, what kind of student were you? And I, I think like before high school, um, and how did you kind of fit in with your peers or your fellow students, your classmates? I was a really, really good student up until high school. And when the hormones kicked in, I went, I just, I don't know what happened. I lost my mind. But I was really good at school, really smart. Um, and I got along with all the other kids. And yeah, I had no problems. 
<laughs> and then I became really aware of my physicality and I think that sort of made me nuts. You know, I suddenly was starting to get teased for being a redhead. I was told I was ugly. I started to feel ugly. I started looking at all the other women around me who I considered beautiful and they, yeah, I just always felt really, really, as the hormones kicked in more and more, I got really messed up by my body. Um, and, well, before we talk more about that, another thing I wanted to ask you was, um, your family was very religious, and I read that you disavowed religion when you were 12. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about that a bit, and then how you view religion or like spirituality now. Well, my dad was my Sunday school teacher, so that also messed me up a little. But I was a very devout child. I mean, I had a relationship with Jesus when I was wee, and I really believed in, I really believed in the concept of Jesus. I really fully invested in it. And then again, as I, big, as I matured and sort of turned 10, I started realizing, hmm, all these people that are at my dad's church, they're sort of pretending to be good, but they're not actually very good. And I sort of, you know, as children are really smart that the way, way I think, I think they figure out really fast of the sort of hypocrisy that was involved in the practice of religion. And I rejected it very strongly. Um, and used to have a lot of uh, debates with my father from a very early age over the um, the Sunday dinner table. Um, and I was relentless and I just kept pushing and questioning and it used to make my dad crazy. But yes, I just decided, I think when I was 12, that I would no longer go to church and I refused point blank to go. And, and I've been going my own way ever since. Uh, I'm not a big fan of organised religion. I don't. I respect people's faith. I, I would never ever dare say to somebody, you know, you don't know, um, and I do. But for me personally, I have no uh, leanings towards any organised faith whatsoever. I, I I know what I believe to be right, and that's what I adhere to. I believe in a moral life, but I don't believe in a religious one really. But as I said, I respect other people's beliefs. And this is this is why we filled out that form earlier. Uh oh, here it comes. Here it comes. I'm I'm ready. I'm girding my loins. <laughs> okay. um, well, I I read that you had a very uh, difficult time in secondary school, which is like high school in the mm -hmm. U.S., right? Um, so I mean, if you could just talk about that time period, and then you know what you planned on doing after high school, or what your plans were for yourself. Yeah, when I went to high school, I had a lot of problems. I was badly bullied by a really unfortunate soul, as it turns out. She had a, she came from a really rough background. Of course, I didn't know this at the time. You know, you're young, you don't understand the world. All I knew was this girl was big and she was scary and she had it in for me because she could sense I came from a nice family. And um, I was confident and I was a good student and she just obviously decided I am going to take this person out and she'd sort of terrorized me for a year and I was really scared and then just one day I lost my temper um, I just couldn't hack her pushing on me any longer and I sort of stood up to her and uh, she was like you know I'm gonna be you say you're gonna be you blah, 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 blah. and uh, I took my earrings out and put flat shoes on and got ready to get absolutely kicked in and she never showed up and that was sort of the end of bullying for me that year but it had already derailed me so completely I had lost interest and enthusiasm for being a good student I realized it was making me become a target so I sort of started to diminish my own light in a funny way and coupled with an influx of hormones and a sudden self-consciousness about my body it was just a fiasco it sounds great. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy it happened to me now. At the time, I was really miserable. I mean, I was, I was literally sent half mad over it because I didn't want to complain really to my parents. And even when I did eventually tell them, they were like, figure it out. You need to figure it out. And I was so angry at them because I thought, well, they could sort this out in a nanosecond. They could go to the school and tell this nasty girl to just back off. And they wouldn't. And it made me crazy angry at my family. 
And I just suddenly was like, okay, I'm on my own. I need to like, go, I need to go through the jungle by myself, taking care of myself. And as horrible as it was, I'm really grateful it happened that way, you know, because now I'm not scared of people bullying me. I can stand up to anyone at this point. I'm not, I'm not fearful of what someone's going to say, or even if somebody's physically threatening me to a certain degree, I've got this crazy like anti-bullying madness that comes in. Like I just kick into animal style. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, I'm grateful it happened in the end. But, you know, you can't tell a kid that, can you? Yeah. I mean, don't you, like, don't you feel like it kind of makes you a more empathetic kind of adult, like you said, with the... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I am... Just reactionary. I don't know. I mean, I am an empathetic person. I don't know whether that was because I, I was bullied or whether I was just reared that way. I'm sensitive. I'm an artist. I don't know. Mm. Um, I, would rather, I, I would hope that most people escape being bullied, but... To those who are being bullied, it's like there's good news at the end of it. If you survive, which likelihood is you will, you'll be all the better, stronger for it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, what were your plans after high school? I don't know if this is correct, but did you want to become an actor? So you're planning on acting? I had an amazing teacher at my high school, an, an acting teacher who was very much like Miss Jean Brody, And she plucked about six or seven girls out of my year at school and invited us to join Edinburgh Youth Theatre, which was an extracurricular activity outside of school, uh, where she basically fostered this desire amongst all these girls, gals, to um, get involved in theatre. And she really sort of lit a fire under all of us. And it was very much like Miss Jean Brodie and her girls. And we sort of all fell in love with with playwrights and and movies and plays and so on and so forth and that is kind of what I wanted to do but I also had you know fantasies of being a journalist but if the truth be told I never really believed in myself I never thought that I would ever get to be an actor and I never thought I was a good enough writer to be a journalist so to be honest I was sort of panicked all the way through school particularly as I was retreating more and more from from my studies. I mean, I just didn't bother going to school a lot of the time, and I certainly didn't do any studying. So I was a bit of a loser, if the truth be told. <laughs> oh, stay in school, kids. <laughs> yeah. Um, so did, mu did music... Uh, you did not play in any bands or anything until... Well, after high school, um, when you joined Goodbye Mr. McKenzie, that was your very first band? Mm -hmm. Okay. And was that just because, like, what, what did you hope to do when you graduated and kind of, like, went out on your own and you I, weren't feeling very I, I have I had no plans. I mean, I really didn't. I... I was I was smoking and drinking and dabbling in drugs by that point, and my, my dad had removed all pocket money. So then I was stealing money from my parents. I was just a low life, you know. And um, I didn't have any plans. I didn't have a clue. You were still living at home? I was still living at home. Uh, but I was also living at my boyfriend's house. And, you know, I just had a very unstructured sort of last year or so at high school. And, and then I got a um, Saturday job at... Uh, female clothing store which was called Miss Selfridge which is sort of the equivalent of like Forever 21 or something like that and I was working there and then I got offered a part-time job there and I took that and then I was there for five years working yeah, a I shitty job your, yeah your customer service I had really bad group. customer service attitude I have to confess it was pretty bad um yeah, so can you kind of talk about how you fell into like singing with local bands and then how you joined that very first band, how that happened? Well, again, it goes back to sort of Edinburgh Youth Theatre. I was still involved in that. I was very passionate about being involved in, the, in that uh, group. And one year we were performing at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, which is a big arts festival in Edinburgh every year, where amateur theatrics take place and young people put on shows and whatnot. And... Uh, our group was putting on a show and we needed vocal augmentation, i.e. we needed people who could sing. And this boy, young man, came and helped. He was a friend of, an, of another member of the youth theatre. He came to help on vocals and he had this band called Goodbye Mr McKenzie. And 
he was looking for a keyboard player and backing vocalist and he said do you play and I was like yeah I play a little bit of piano and he was like well would you like to come and join my band I was like yeah okay I mean I didn't have any like real enthusiasm for that either <laughs> I mean I was just sort of like yeah okay I'll, I'll do that and then again I, I ended up being in that band for 10 years. Did you know were you confident in your singing ability? Before that, or? You've got to understand something. Okay. I've had no um, confidence in my abilities at my entire life until mm, I'd say maybe when I was maybe 45, did I suddenly think, actually I, I can sing and actually I'm pretty good at what I do. But I had no confidence in myself, my entire career almost. So Better late than never though, right? I mean, yeah. I finally got there, but it took a long time for me to even think of myself as an artist. Mm. And uh, I mean, I have a billion and one theories about that, but yeah, that's the truth of it. No, I didn't. I knew I could hold a tune, but it, almost anyone could hold a tune. Mm. Almost anyone. Debatable. Yeah. <laughs> um, and how long were you in uh, the first band and then how did you come to join Angelfish? I was in Goodbye Mr. McKenzie for about 10 years and we had made three studio records and we were signed first of all to Capitol Records, EMI, and then we got grabbed by Radioactive Records which was headed up by Gary Kerfurst who's a very well known music manager since deceased but what at the time looked after such luminaries as like you know Blondie and Talking Heads and the Ramones and we had a really good reputation and he signed our band after us opening for Blondie in the 80s he saw us and signed us because he was really interested in us he sent us to Berlin to make a record we spent the entire advance on drugs and alcohol and just having a good time and spent, I think, 100k, came back to Edinburgh and we had nothing to show for it, at which point he dropped us, but held on to me because he believed in me. He was like, I just think that you could end up doing something. And so then, goodbye, Miss McKenzie, we basically just jiggered everything around. I took, like, the, le the lead role of singer and then the lead singer of the band became the lead guitarist and we just sort of jiggered things around and then got re-signed as Angelfish. Was there any um, like resentment within the band with you kind of like taking over the? Thing? Well, resentment is maybe a strong word because you know again it's it's being in a band so complicated and it's so uh, difficult to manoeuvre everybody's roles and make sure everybody's taken care of and even though it's always a group effort, somebody always gets more attention than the other, so it causes tension. I think tension is probably the fairer word and yes it caused a lot of tension because the minute you're the lead singer you're just automatically in a certain role and that's your job a lead singer is called a lead singer for a reason you know and if a band is functioning well then the lead singer usually is the one who becomes the interface between the world and the band and so yeah it caused a lot of tension between me and my former bandmates of good Mr. McKenzie because all of a sudden I was being asked questions by the record label and I was making decisions because that's just the way it went. And yeah, they didn't like it so much and they got frustrated and decided they didn't want to do Angelfish anymore and basically left me in the middle of a tour. We were in New York, literally on the day I got a phone call from, from Garbage to say, do you want to come up and have an audition with us? I was like, yeah, I'll get on the next bus. I'll see you next tomorrow morning or whatever it was and that it was just this weird slide into a new life you just started answering the next question oh but i did i do want to ask um be, being on a, on a label and being a working musician at that time in uh you know pre-garbage were you able to support yourselves playing music did you have to work other jobs or was that like what you did? No, I, I worked in Miss, Miss Selfridge for a long time and then when we finally got signed, we made a little money for a couple of years, but I wasn't a writer, so I didn't make any of the advance money, which is where the significant cash came from and the publishing. So I was basically on a really kind of sad, measly little wage from the other members of the band. Um, and so I quickly learned about band economics. It was pretty harsh, but 
I, I earned just enough to survive. But, you know, I didn't have a car or anything like that, so I didn't have massive overheads. I still lived at home. I mean, I basically lived at home until I was 28. And then I, my boyfriend at the time was a janitor, and so we got a free, what they called a tied house. So we lived in a free house, basically, because he was the janitor of this mad clock tower. I mean, it's a whole mad story. But, yeah, so my overheads were really low. I didn't really need much money. Um... Was there ever a point when you were in Angelfish, or maybe it happened when you were in Garbage, that you that you thought, okay, I'm going to do music as a career? Never. Never. I mean, even when we blew up in Garbage, when Garbage blew up and we were all over the place, I felt that it was temporary and that I couldn't allow myself to enjoy it too much because I was Cinderella and before I knew it, my carriage would turn into a pumpkin and I'd be back in the clock tower cleaning floors. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and you kind of just started talking about it, but you got a call from Butch Big to go and audition for this band. Um, yeah, I guess instead of asking really specific questions about that, if you could just talk about that experience and doing the audition and eventually joining the band. Yeah, I mean, it, it's strange because everything's a bit of a blur, but we, as Goodbye Miss McKenzie, had been really poorly managed. And we had a horrendous situation where the tax had not been paid by the two main songwriters in the band for all their publishing and their recording advances. There'd been no tax paid. So the tax man came after the band and because we weren't protected, I found myself facing hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of debt to the British government, but having had not made really a penny. I mean, I, I literally got like, you know, a pounds for my wages and because the band hadn't been protected as a limited company or something weird like that. I can't remember the exact details, but we were all on the hook for this massive amount of money that only two members of the band had seen. And we were all freaking out. And of course, we'd just been dropped because Gary Kerfus was sick of our shenanigans and things were pretty grim. And um, Angelfish was sort of struggling through, but it wasn't a very happy enterprise. And I was literally doing the dishes one day and I got a phone call um, from Radioactive in the, in the US here in LA from my a &R guy at Radioactive, Phil Schuster, and he said to me, you know, okay, something outrageous has happened. We've just heard from Butchvig and I'm sort of nodding along going, mm -hmm, thinking, who the, who the fuck is Butchvig? And he's like, we've just heard from Butchvig. He's very interested in meeting you about his project that he's working on. And I'm like, okay, like, who's Butchvig? And he was like, you know, well... He just produced Nevermind, he produced Dirty by Sonic Youth, he produced, you know, Smashing Pumpkins, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, whoa, oh my God, you know. And of course I knew all these records, but I'd never paid attention to who produced what. And they were like, are you interested in having a meeting? I was like, yeah, of course, you know. But I never again thought it would ever come to anything. But I went and met them down in London, The book, Steve, Duke and Steve, who were to come my, become my bandmates. I met them in the Landmark Hotel on, on uh, I think it's called the Edgware Road in London. And we had a meeting and we all got along very nicely. We all got along very well, actually. We had a very similar sense of humour. We liked all the same kind of music and artists and so on and so forth. Uh, they said, well, we haven't decided what we're going to do yet. We're thinking of having a multitude of singers. You know, it's been great meeting you. See you around. And I was like, yep. Great, it's great meeting you. Good luck with your project. I remember saying that said, very earnestly. Good luck with your project, no matter how it, how it goes, you know. And then I remember leaving them at the corner and going off to my friend's house, switching on the TV, and it was it was the day that God bless him, Kurt Cobain had lost his life, had killed himself, and it it was a, such a bizarre moment for me because you know. It was sort of, I felt attached to this experience because I'd just been with Butch an hour before, you know, and he was so involved in the Nirvana story. And I just remember go, like feeling like electricity pulsing through me and, and being so sad about it because he was such a great, Kurt was such a great artist and 
Nirvana was such an amazing band, but also this bizarre experience of having just met Butch. And, and that basically was the beginning of, of my career was, you know, I got a, a call late, a couple of weeks later and they wanted to meet me. I was on tour in America with Angel Fish and they were like, come up and have an audition. And it was the day that my band had said, we're done here. We don't want to do this anymore. And I was like, okay, <laughs> fair enough. And I went up to Madison and I had my first edition and the rest is sort of literally my, my history. Um, can you talk about what the, what the band dynamics and your role in the, in the band was at the beginning and then how that sort of changed over time? You referred to the beginning phases of Garbage as being like in an arranged marriage mm -hmm. and the, uh, then, you know, being more equal. Well, yeah, I mean, it was really strange to go and work with, you know, people I had never met. I didn't know, you know, I'd been in a band for 10 years. I was really tight with my bandmates and we were all very much of a similar age. And of course, Garbage, the, the men in Garbage are so much older than me and they've had a very different life from me. And so I was really like a fish out of water and I was really uncomfortable you know, because they felt old to me and, you know, I was really immature and and I wanted a distance, I think. I wanted to distance myself from them because I was convinced there was no way in hell this would work. I was just like, there is no way in, the, in hell this can possibly fly. These guys are old. <laughs> These guys are old. This is a phony way for us to come together. We're screwed. And... I was away from home, I had no money, so I could never even phone home. I mean, I was in a tight spot. I was barely eating because I had no cash. The only time I would eat would be when I was in the studio with the band and they would buy dinner. I was too proud to tell them I had no, no money and so on and so forth. So it was a very, very uncomfortable environment for me. I didn't drive, so I had to walk to the studio and back every day unless I got a, a lift from one of the band but it was either boiling hot or freezing cold. And so I was just physically discomforted all the time. And yeah, it wasn't very fun. And then I would work five days a week and then at weekends they would go home to their families and I would literally be a shut-in in this bizarre hotel, which was on the edge of a lake and was practically uh, empty all year long. And it was like the Hotel in the Shining. And I would just wander up and down corridors and use pennies to, to get like packets of crisps and a, maybe a Babe Ruth from the vending machine in the corridor and then scuttle back to my, my bedroom and watch base, basketball or baseball all, all weekend long because I had nothing else to do and I didn't know anyone. And then I would come in to the studio on a Monday morning and I'd be a raging cunt. At the very beginning? <laughs> Almost at the beginning. Yeah. Almost at the beginning. You know, I mean, the novelty wears off real fast. You're in a strange country for a month. The novelty's worn off weeks ago. You're just making everything sound so awesome. I can't wait to go and start another band. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. Well, I mean, obviously garbage like, I mean to me it was like you didn't exist and then all of a sudden I heard about this band and you were just huge um but if you could kind of describe the the recording of the debut album and and the trajectory um to that level of commercial and critical success yeah I mean it's so surreal I still can't actually believe it happened to me I mean I sometimes I look back on my own life and think I cannot believe this is my life and this is my story and so, yeah, I went over and started recording with these three freaks that I didn't know from Adam. But we slowly kind of fell in love with one another. You know, we really do share a very similar philosophy in life. And we're all, we always joke that we come from the Northern Hemisphere. So we're sort of like, we're weird Viking kind of freaks from, you know, the Nordic countries. And um, we started chancing upon a very easy working relationship as it turns out um i mean i was very submissive back then i was smart enough to know that if i fucked anybody off 
I probably wouldn't be sticking around. You know, I understood where the power seat lay and it wasn't my seat. And I didn't want, I knew it was a really good opportunity for me. And I enjoyed working on music with them in the end. I mean, it took a while, it wasn't immediate. Um, but by the end of the recording process, I was starting to get excited. Um, I didn't think we had a chance really in hell, but it had been an interesting experience and I was glad I had done it. And then we got an opportunity to give a track to, at the time, uh, what was considered very hip, which was a CD magazine called Volume, which came out of the UK and it was very hip. And it had all this sort of like upcoming new bands. And we got invited to, to give a track to Volume. And we gave Vow, as it turns out, which was our first single. But um, the only reason we gave that track out was because it was the only one that was even remotely close to being finished. So we put it out on volume and it got an extraordinary response out of the UK and out of Australia and they started playing it on the radio and all of a sudden record labels started like biting and wanting to sign us and getting very excited and things were starting to boil in the press and all of a sudden we could feel it ourselves even though we were in the Midwest in Madison, Wisconsin, the middle of nowhere, um, completely isolated actually from the industries of anywhere, um, even we began to feel feel it and I think we all started to go oh my god this could actually be a reality in the end but it was really unexpected and it was like wildfire it just caught it ignited and all of a sudden we, we had a sort of flame and then before that we knew it it had grown into a fire and record labels were falling over themselves to come and sign us and it was exciting and what was it like for you personally you know kind of going from, I don't want to say obscurity because you were in, you know, work, working bands that played and toured, but relative obscurity to being like huge and known and like on the covers of magazines and everyone knows who you are. Yeah, I mean, it was intense. It was intense. It was unexpected, uninvited really in a way. It was, I had never, ever chased after the kind of success I've enjoyed. I, I can actually remember saying to somebody once, I just, I, if I could just be as big as Echo and the Bunnymen, I would be so happy. It would be the coolest, it would just be the coolest. And you know, we, our, our ambitions were to, you know, just be a good alternative band that, that had a modest career. And then before we knew it, we were, you know, topping charts. I mean, it was crazy. And the, the thing that I don't think people quite understand about that trajectory for us was that whole period in the 90s was the first time alternative music, i.e. anyone who was non-conformist, suddenly became the popular kids. We suddenly were overtaking everything. Like if you weren't alternative, you weren't getting played on MTV, you weren't getting played on the radio, you weren't getting on the front cover of magaz music magazines. So it was a surprise for everyone, you know, and just this mad movement that began arguably, you know, with sort of grunge and then exploded and puffed, like, and disappeared in a puff of air when September 11th occurred but th there was that mad tra trajectory for a moment. Yeah. This is kind of a dumb question, but I'm curious. I like dumb down, questions. Ask, who, what was it like to be, and I think all of your bands, you were the only woman in your band. Oh, that's not true? Mm, no. Oh, okay. No, Goodbye Miss McKenzie had another female, Rona Scobie, who was my partner in crime. Okay. So I'm gonna ask it a different way. What's it like <laughs> being the only woman in a band with all men, in a big, you know, a famous band. I guess we'll just refer to garbage. Well, I think the question really is more, what was it like being the, the youngest member of the band and being the only female? Mm -hmm. And also in a band with three musicians who were also considered producers, which again, I, it's really difficult now to think of how producers were perceived back then. You know, now the line between musician and producer has been so blurred. Um, you know, now you have 
so many artists who are also phenomenal producers, you know, whether it's Jack White, whether it's Kanye West, whether it's Grimes, you know, there's that wall between producer and musician has been broken. But back when I emerged in the 90s with Garbage, that was a, a big deal that there was a producer in, in the band. And in my band, there were three producers. And then I was this, I felt like I was perceived as this kind of dummy, lucky little bunny who came along and fluffed everything and made it look a little prettier. But I felt very um, much as though, well, there was a multitude of things going on. One, I felt uh, that I wasn't as talented as my band. Two, I certainly wasn't as respected and probably never would be. And uh, three, I felt I felt dominated. So there was a lot of things going on. I mean, that very quickly changed. But uh, certainly at the beginning, even the the people that we worked with at the record label were always sort of saying, you know, we're going to try and get her press, but they're only going to want to talk to you, Butch. And that was what was presented to me right at the beginning. And I was, I was a little uh, intimidated by that because it immediately made me feel like, well, I'm not doing my job. I'm not good at my job and I'm not doing my job. And as I said, that very, very quickly changed, thank God, because otherwise I don't think the band would have ever worked if I hadn't been as dominant as I am. I mean, I'm a pretty dominant and articulate and, you know, upfront individual. Um, so I managed to save myself in the end. But I think if I'd been a more gentle, more reticent female, I probably would have been drowned out. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you don't have a strong figurehead in a band, you're going to get totally um, tanked, ro steamrolled over by any other bands who are around at the time. You know, you have to stand out. You know, you need to have a good peacock. And I was a really effective peacock. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, I do. well, so back then, I mean, the music in industry still existed and, and functioned a certain way, um, and it doesn't so much anymore. A lot has changed. Um, but from, you know, from the, the debut album, uh, version 2.0, Beautiful Garbage, Bleed Like Me, <coughs> what was your overall experience um, being on a major label? Um, what was the wor the workload like? Um, you know, the touring schedule, I imagine, it is was rigorous. Well, we weren't actually on a major label when we first came out. We signed to an independent label called Mushroom Records in the UK and out of Australia, and we also signed to an independent here in the US, which was Almo Records, which actually was the next incarnation of A and M Records. So we were very independent right from the start. Um, so from that point of view, we were very lucky. We were, no, we were not in the major label system for the first two records. And because the trajectory of our career was so incredible for the first two records, we were left to our own devices pretty much. We weren't a and would we were, we were, because we had Butch, who was this respected producer, we were left alone in the studio. We basically just did our own thing, delivered the records, and that was the end of it. And we were the zeitgeist in Vogue band. I was the it girl. I mean, the amount of opportunities that came our way were ridiculous. The amount of front covers I got were almost bordering on embarrassing to the point where I remember getting very self-conscious and sort of like, I'm being overexposed here, this is not good. And the, but the workload was insane. But that I have to take a lot of sort of uh, responsibility for because I, I made my band work. Because I knew how difficult it was out there. I, I had come from a touring band, they hadn't. And I was like, we need to work. If we want to stick around, we're going to have to work because you have to connect with people. If you don't connect with people, they're on to the next person about two seconds later. And so we worked and sometimes we'd be p playing two gigs a day and we had very little sleep and we were kind of exhausted. Um, and I don't regret a minute of it. I mean, I'm so grateful that we had the energy and the willingness to put in that kind of work because it's paid off 
in spades for 22 years at this point. Mm. But things then, I'm just suddenly remembering what your question was. But then the problem was we got sold by um, A&M Records. Uh, Well, excuse me. We got sold by Almo Records to Interscope, which was a massive major label. And Jerry Moss, who ran Almo Records, did not ask our permission, didn't say, you know, I'm thinking of selling my label and give us any due warning. He just sold us to Interscope Records and we had, there was absolutely nothing we could do about it. So having been this massive band on a small label, we became a small band on a massive label that was in the business of pop commercial success. And we really floundered there and our career basically tanked because we didn't want to make the kind of compromises that a major label was asking us to make. Mm. And it caused a lot of tension between us and our label and therefore it also caused a lot of tension between bandmates. That was my experience of the music industry. Yeah, it doesn't sound good. I mean, do you think it's better that things are better now for, for bands or...? No, I think the music industry remains a cesspit. A cesspit. <coughs> pretty much. Um, I mean, you know, if you just think about what it is, for a label to compete, they need to want to be the biggest and they want to be the best. And if your label isn't wanting to be the biggest and the best, you're probably not with the right label. So it's a commercial enterprise and it, and it preys on the desires of musicians to have their work heard. And it's a nasty relationship, much like a pimp and a, and a streetwalker. And it's pretty simple. And you have to decide as an artist, well, am I willing to get into bed with a nasty old pimp for a couple of years to see if I can reach an audience? And then I'll worry about the consequences later, you know, which I think is the, what the majority of artists do. And then, unfortunately, the powers that be and commerce and... and and so on and competition they are powerful forces and they can often corrupt the artist or they'll destroy the artist and it's so therefore it's it's kind of a nasty business you said that i think beautiful garbage was the album where like the band wasn't really getting along anymore but that was kind of the beginning of the end uh, for a while for garbage and I think you said you associated it with personal like difficulties and well we were still getting along during beautiful garbage but I was under a lot of personal duress I was going through a divorce and because there was so much sort of tabloid intrusion in my life at that point I didn't feel I could talk to anybody about it I didn't feel I could discuss it with anyone including my band I was scared that the tabloids would get hold of it So I basically went through this monumental breakup. My whole life kind of fell apart and I didn't tell anyone. And I basically, you know, was on the cusp of of having a nervous breakdown. I was under a lot of pressure, you know, I was a huge pop star at this point, you know, and and so it was, yeah, I I had a difficult time. I, I was really, I was really disappointed in myself and I was really hard on myself and, so yeah the band was still getting along during beautiful garbage and actually we were really proud of the record we made we we could have done a retread of version 2.0 we decided to take some risks and we made a very unexpected sounding record that caught everyone up by off guard and when we finished the record our record labels came and heard the record our managers came and everybody was like whoa this is incredible it's incredible we sent sort of advanced copies to journalists. We got amazing reviews. And then we were set to launch the record um, two days after September 11th. And we woke up on September 11th like the rest of the world and the world had completely changed. And it, amongst much more important things, i.e. changing the world and devastating people's lives and so on and so forth, and it's arguable whether the world has ever really recovered. Um, one could say the same thing about what it did to our career at the time because it just killed the momentum of that record release and we never really regained that release opportunity again. And so by the time 
the world had sort of reconvened and sort of normal-ish life, normal service had resumed, we had missed our window of promotion and opportunity. And, and that record, although it sold a million copies, it was seen as a massive commercial failure. And that's when the problems began because then the record companies started getting involved because they thought they could fix this problem. And in point of fact, by this point too, the musical landscape had changed and we found ourselves having been the four, four sort of sort of very forward thinking band, we found ourselves behind the curve. And a lot of, of other acts were in the place where we had once been and we were sort of the old has-beens and that was very difficult to negotiate. Yeah. Does it happen that when you reach a certain level of success, um, that your kind of baseline for what is successful changes. And I'm thinking it's just like in indie music, you know, like we've all played in bands and it's like, oh my God, if I've ever sold like, you know, a hundred thousand copies of anything, <laughs> it would be, wow. Yeah, I mean, um, we were the same. I mean, we were selling millions of records and we were like cock a hoop. We were like, holy fuck, this is out of control, you know? Um, but the record labels get really greedy and they're like, well, you know, yeah, you sold 35,000 records last week, but hey, no doubt sold 55,000. And that you? affects you as, as a Of course it does. That, yeah, you're basically yeah. being told by your record label you're not doing good enough. And so it's just this constant feeling of like, we just never felt that we were ever getting anywhere because it was never enough. And we were playing our asses off we we toured literally for something like two years on each album campaign and yet we were constantly being told by labels all over the world i.e whether it was the germans or the french or the israelis or the australians they were like well you haven't been here enough so you know we can't continue to put your promote your record if you don't come here physically and and and, and invest in our country and we were like we can't do it we're gonna die you know, and my marriage was falling apart and I was like, well, I don't know what more you want from us, but we can't actually give you any more. It's impossible. So it was, it was demoralizing, you know, at, at the same time as also being amazing. I mean, I'm not trying to sort of portray a woe is me. We have been so lucky and we have loved every single second of it. But I think it's important to talk about the realities of it, you know, of that experience, because it's the same story for everyone. I didn't know that at the time, but now that I'm older and I'm watching other acts come up, I'm like, oh, they're going through, they're going through exactly what we went through. You know, let's see how they weather this. Um, yeah, and you talked about September 11th and the kind of, you know, conservative political climate that, that arose from that um, as, as playing a part in you know, the end of, I don't want to say the end of garbage because you're back and you're doing stuff, but, um, well, that killed us off while. as a pop band that yeah. killed us as a pop band for sure. I'm not entirely sad that happened to be honest, but at the time it was devastating because you just feel like I'm never going to recover from this. My, my whole career is now over, you know, by this point I was my mid thirties and I'm like, I'm screwed. As a woman, I'm screwed. You don't, women don't get to come back from 35 and a completely disastrous career. It just doesn't happen in the music business, you know. And I convinced myself of this. As it turns out, it was completely wrong. But, you know, you don't know this at the time. And it's difficult. It's difficult to, to sustain the blow of a public fall from grace. It's embarrassing, it's uncomfortable, your identity's locked up in how people perceive your band. And yeah, I, it was a very, very tough time in my life, for sure. And this came up in Patty's interview. We, we did it a couple years ago, and she's like, "Don't if you ever interview Shirley, you have to ask her this. Um, but around the same time, in the early 2000s, you know, you had like the Britney Spears and pop was kind of coming, and so the really great decade for women and strong female rock musicians in the 90s was kind of over and then you had Limp Bizkit and the misogynistic kind of bands yeah. and uh, women pop artists. Um, why do you, do you have any thoughts on why women have to work so hard for like uh, longevity or to remain 
kind of consistently relevant? Like, it seems to happen in, in cycles. Just do you have any thoughts on that? Of course, I have many thoughts okay, on that. <laughs> um, but just to point out, after September 11th, they stopped playing non-conformist women on the radio. I mean, that's just a blanket rule of thumb. They stopped playing anyone who was in sort of disagreement with the mainstream. They, we just were unable to get on the radio. And so that sort of put a, a full stop to all the alt girls of the 90s. That was the end of the run. And it, it's open to argument whether that we've even recovered from that yet. And we're now in, what, 2018? Um, I think it goes back to sort of the binary patriarchal system that's in place to this day. You know, there's a patriarchal system that has been put in place that allows men to thrive. And women historically have been kind of eradicated from the narrative in all areas of life, um, you know, whether it's science, whether it's maths, whether it's arts, whether it's, you know, history. It's just our voices have been drowned out. And therefore, you know, this it continues to be very difficult for women's uh, legacies to be even acknowledged, um, let alone stick around. I think we rear our children to believe that the highest currency for a woman is beauty and youth. And when she loses her beauty and she uses her youth, we are encouraged to believe we are then, therefore, we have no agency and it's all over and we're on the rubbish heap and we are of no value to culture and society. And I feel like women themselves have bought into this. Um, I think they've allowed themselves to believe that this is the case. Oh, when, I'm, when I have a line on my face, I, I'm no longer of interest to anybody. And I think deep, deep down, we really believe that. And I think it's because it all goes back to caveman times when it had to be the most beautiful, most virile, potent woman that got the alpha male who was able to kill the bear, drag the bear back to the cave and therefore sustain the family. It, I mean, I'm serious. I'm, I'm being silly, but I also am serious. And I think, therefore, women don't always stick around to compete when, they're, when their bloom of youth starts to fall away. They, they hide and they literally go and hide and they stop trying and they stop competing and they allow themselves to be shrunk by a sort of patriarchal system of control. And I mean, I'm talking in very dramatic terms and, and I, I think it's, there's also very subtle things at play, but I do think essentially that's what's, what has gone on so if you're not sticking around long enough, it's hard to be seen as this amazing artist who's, who's, who's made their mark on music or fashion or, like I said, science and so on and so forth. If you've, if you've disappeared to have children or you've just stopped trying, then, you know, female competition gets eradicated and it's the male totem pole that stands, you know, and is worshipped. And you did another, you did uh, Bleed Like Me, and that was the last album before the significant break. Did you think that you had broken up forever at that point? And, and how were you feeling? What were you planning on doing? <coughs> did you have any plans? Well, to be fair, we never broke up, okay. ever. We just had a, a very frank conversation, which was, we were on tour, it was really unpleasant, we weren't getting along well, and I said to, to my band, I'm going home, I've had enough, I'm going home, this is not fun, and I don't want to make another record because I feel like if we make another record and put it out, it doesn't even matter if it's Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band, it's going to be rejected, we are out of sync with the culture, we need to go home, re-educate ourselves, invest in life, relearn the rules and and think again and that's what happened we just went home and because we weren't getting along we just didn't even contact one another and then the years passed and my mother got dangerously ill 
and we knew she wasn't going to last much longer. She had a very aggressive form of dementia. And so I didn't even think about making music. I was just sort of trying to get through life. And then when my mum died, a whole spate of other horrendous things happened to those we loved. One of our friends lost their six-year-old kid. My best friend from sort of home lost her young husband. It was just a just a just a one thing after another. We were always at funerals. I mean, it was mad. And of course, when you're in pain, you want to be creative. And I really started to miss the band and miss the fun. And finally, I went to Coachella, and I watched a whole day of Coachella. And I was looking at the bands and thinking, why have I allowed? the music industry to make me think that I'm not as good as whatever is going on here, because I know I am. And I rarely feel confident, but I can smoke 99.9% .9 of anyone here today. And it just made me think, you know what, fuck this. I'm going to go and make music. And I don't care if I'm not successful. I don't care if people think I'm a loser. I need to, to do this. And I was at a memorial for my friend's son, six-year-old son, who lost his life to, to Wilms' tumour. And I had been asked to sing a Bowie song, Life on Mars, to honour Pablo, their son. And I sang at the memorial and it was pretty intense. And Butch was there and I bumped into him and we sort of looked at one another and he was like, I want to be making music. And it was so good to hear you sing. And I was like, yeah, I want to be making music too. Like, why are we not making music? This is mad, you know? And he went, you call Steve, I'll call Duke. And I was like, okay. And then that was basically it. We just got back together again and started working. And we had a very sort of punk rock attitude, which was, fuck everybody. Like, I don't care if they say we're shit. Let's just do something that makes us feel good and that's what we focused on and then we've just sort of rebuilt our career on our own terms we're completely independent of everybody and anything we're you know we're free we run free and that's been extraordinary Sophia will murder me if I don't ask you about Terminator how did, you, how did you fall into TV? It's a bloody good question. I mean, it's like a joke. This is my life, I swear. If you've ever seen the Woody Allen movie, Zalig, oh. I am Zalig. I mean, I find myself in these ridiculous sort of circumstances. And I had, I'm a pretty good, or certainly back then, I was pretty good pals with Gwen Stefani and I'd been at her baby shower. And I bumped into this guy who was working um, on a screenplay with James Elroy, their novelist, and someone who I was obsessive fan of. And My Dark Places is one of my all-time favourite books. And uh, so I got talking to the screenwriter about James Elroy, and we were sort of like really engaged. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, he said, have you ever done any acting? And I was like, yes, I used to go. I was a member of Edinburgh Youth Theatre. <laughs> and he goes... He says, I'm writing this TV show about uh, Terminator. And I was like, I love Terminator, because I always have. I've loved it, the whole notion of killer robots and AI and so on and so forth. And he said, well, would you be interested in auditioning? And I went, yeah, of course. Never thinking in a million years this would ever come to anything. And a couple of weeks later, I got called up to go on an audition. And I was put through my paces, and I ended up getting the part. And it was originally just for, I think, five episodes, but they loved my character, so it got extended into the whole series. And I was driving onto the Warner Brothers lot, and I had my own little parking space with my name on it, and one of the director's chairs with my name on it. And it was literally like, I mean, it was like a dream. It was silly. It was fun. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? <laughs> Do you have any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Weaver was a force for good, <laughs> just so you know. Getting back together, not your kind of people, was like a reaction to being rejected by labels and you're doing everything yourself. Um, Strange Little Birds, I love. Thank and, you. Um, not your kind of people seemed kind of more um, 
political and like you seem pissed, you know pissed off strange little birds I was really surprised um, lyrically uh, because you seem to really be expressing the, the insecurities that you said you've had since you were young which I you know never would have guessed well, it's interesting that you talk about the Terminator experience because after doing that TV show, which was just fell into my lap, I sort of became interested in sci-fi, the genre of sci-fi. And my agent said to me, look, if you want to do any more acting, you're going to need to study with a teacher. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to study with a teacher. I mean, I was almost panicked. Um, and she was like, well, I really suggest that you think about it. And so eventually I garnered the confidence and the balls to walk into an acting class. And I was so lucky that I stumbled upon this incredible teacher called Sharon Chatton. And while studying under this woman, she taught me a couple of really incredible fundamental um, things that have really stuck with me about being an artist, about telling the truth, about how you can only really be your best, most complete self as an artist when you're telling 100% the truth and you're not serving anything but your own story and for some reason it was the way she told me shared these lessons with me the way she expressed what being a true artist is it just it changed something in me and I realized that the stakes were getting higher and higher for me as a woman. I was aging, you know, when we made Strange Little Birds, I was coming up to being 50. And I suddenly realized that I had been in service a lot of my career to what people expected from me, what people wanted from me. I felt very much a, a loyalty to serve my band, not myself, but my band. And when I came into Strange Little Birds, I guess I just felt selfish and f thought, this, you know, your time, literally, your time is running out. And why don't you just try and be brave and actually be your authentic self? Not that all the other records haven't been authentic to me because they have, but they haven't been my raw self. They've been the other parts of myself you know we're all made up of so many you know core like cores and shells and layers and I wanted to get into being fragile because I know people I am tough and people see me as tough but I'm also incredibly sensitive tough people are born of incredible sensitivity you know you learn to keep the pain away and I wanted to investigate what it would be like to really drop all my defense. And it was really interesting to me. And it was, yeah, it was a selfish pursuit and it definitely took our band into a, you know, a very different kind of trajectory. Um, I, and I think maybe the band were a little uncomfortable at first and then because the work turned out to be good and they could relate to it, I think they sort of enjoyed it in the end. But it was very different for us. Yeah, when I played it the first, you know, sometimes is the, is the first song. I, went, I mean, I could identify it with so much of the, the lyrical content on the album, and I was just like, oh man, she had the, the guts to like say it, to just, it seemed like you were singing, you know, just like a journal entry or something yeah. sometimes. Yeah, it was that kind of raw. And that's, and that's rough, it's rough to do, you know, yeah. but it felt exciting, it felt dangerous yeah. to me, and I guess I just want to be I want excitement now when I'm in the studio. I don't want to be writing a pop song that a 20 year old could sing. I'm like, how? what is the most valuable artist I can be? It's telling the truth about what it means to have lived my kind of life, my career at 51. Not many people are telling that story because they're too scared to, because women in particular are scared that they're going to talk themselves out of a career because you know women aren't supposed to age and we're not supposed to be seen past 30. So I felt it was a somewhat punk rock act. Mm -hmm. um, you talk a lot about aging and about um, you know, feeling like a sense of responsibility, being a role model to younger women, but also to, to older women. Um, how, how hard is it for you to like live that yourself? Um, 
you know, like putting yourself out there on stage, um, singing in front of people at, at 51, is it easier to, like, do you feel comfortable or? I feel really comfortable now. Yeah. In my late thirties, I was in pain and I was very angry and I saw a lot of my peers start to, you know, augment themselves and change themselves. And I got really confused and angry and upset. And, uh, and then I somehow have just managed to make my peace with it. And now I feel empowered by it. Because I realized, well, there's nobody else out there doing it. This is, this is my terrain. And until, you know, anyone else steps up, you know, I, this is my territory and I want other people to step up. So I'm in a no lose situation. You know, yeah. I feel like I can encourage other women to hold on to their agency. It's really important to me. I want that for every woman I know, every woman I love, every young woman I meet, every child that's in my life. I want them to be empowered. I feel so passionate about it. I know so many amazing women who literally fold up their wings and disappear because they can't stand the idea of somebody seeing a flaw on their face. And I feel so sad for them. I feel like my heart literally breaks and I want to shake them and say, take your power back. It's yours, you've earned it, you know? I feel so passionate about it. I wish I didn't, I wish I didn't care. Like as my husband's always saying to me, he said, oh, baby, I'm so sorry. I wish you didn't care so much. It's the agony sometimes. But at the same time, it's also, exciting to care. When I went on tour with Blondie, Debbie was 71 years old. And every night I would watch her on stage and I was so struck by how unusual it is to see an older woman with a mass amount of currency still owning her her history, her accomplishments, her humor, her sex. It was so instructive to me and so, it felt so punk rock to me. I was like, this is an extraordinary moment that you are enjoying right now and an instructive one. Cause I'm 51, there are moments when I'm like, I'm ancient. I'm ancient, you know, how, I don't know how much more time I've got, but my time is running out. And then there I was watching another, a woman who's 20 years my senior do what I do every single night with astounding vigor. And I just wanted to bottle Debbie and send it to every single woman in the universe and say, this is 71. Not what you're being sold as 71, but what really is 71. And it was incredible. I was so buzzed from that tour. When I came home, I felt like I'd literally sucked on the virgin blood of <laughs> 20 young men. It was incredible. And uh, I'm so grateful that, you know, Debbie's part of what I call the first generation of women who refuse to conform. So I think of like Debbie Harry, I think of Patti Smith, um, I think of, of Susie Sue and Chrissy Hine, all these women, they were the frontier women. And they are the ones that have started to set new rules. And I'm part of the second generation and we are setting new rules. And I felt that massive thread between me and Debbie and whoever came before her and who's ever coming behind us. And it was really empowering, exciting. Oh, my friend Jen Vest was a photographer in, in Boston. Well, she, she took, yeah, took insane great. photos There's of one me. Of your husband that she took of his head. <laughs> Being a creeper. While you're singing, it's so. <coughs> he's just like looking at you so adoringly. And he's so, like, he didn't know, you know, uh, no one could see him. Yeah, she's a great photographer. She is great. Yeah. And she'll be really excited that she's. <laughs> no, I have. Her. I've sent her a couple of love notes. Like, wow, man, that photo's incredible. Yeah. You know. No, and then she messages me, and she's just like, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> That's so cool. Send him my best. I will. Um, when did you meet your husband and get and get remarried? I got remarried, I think, about eight years ago. Um, I met him in, we, we hired him. He was working with us for years 
and I, I didn't even notice him. He loved me from the second he met me. Alleged. In fact, he loved me apparently before he even met me because he heard me sing. Um, but he, he was literally invisible to me for a long time and then just slowly he worked his magic. Yeah. The p most patient man in the universe. <laughs> Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, how you feel about music criticism or like rock history as it exists. You published a book, uh, The Noise That Keeps Me Awake, the, about garbage. Do you feel a responsibility to kind of preserve and promote your legacy and garbage's legacy? Do you trust that uh, historians or journalists or critics will, you know, do it for you. I feel like it's still a very male kind of dominated. Uh, well, rock history is male dominated. Yeah. I mean, there's no argument there. And no, I don't trust the patriarchy to to give us a good account at all. Neither do, quite honestly, do I really care. I don't care about what. What am I going to care when I'm dead? You know. I try and encourage as many people whilst I'm alive to think differently about women about our role as artists, about our role in culture, but I don't overly concern myself with a legacy of any sort whatsoever. I really couldn't give a shit. Um, we made a book for the children in our lives. It was that, it was really came from that a very modest desire uh, to inform our kids, like as in, you know, Booch has a very young daughter. My, I have a young ne nephew and niece. We wanted them to know about our lives. And that was the reason we made that book. And our management didn't want us to do it. They thought it was too much work and too much effort. And we were just determined. We were like, no, 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 we're leaving this behind for the kids and the grandkids and so on and so forth for our own lineage. And, and we did it and we're really grateful we did it. We're really glad we did it. It was an interesting venture, but it wasn't for any grandiose uh, reasons, to be honest, beyond our family lineage. Yeah. I guess that's grand and grandiose enough, but. <laughs> Um, and I, at the end of it, in every interview, I ask the same uh, three or four questions. Um, what are your thoughts on the visibility of women in rock history in general? I think the visibility of women in rock history in general is very poor. You know, you, you talk about Alice Bag for a random example, this phenomenal you know, character that I knew very little about until recently. And I, I consider myself pretty educated about music. I knew very little about Alice Bag. I was at a, a, an award ceremony last weekend. They talked about this band called Fanny, who I'd never heard of, who had been raved about by no less than David Bowie themselves, himself. And I was thinking to myself, if there was any obscure male band that David Bowie had name checked, we would all know about them. But these women had just been completely buried and forgotten about. And it, high, it underscores this, you know, theory that we continue all to share, which is women have been written out of history. And it's not just contained to music. It's all across the board. And I'm not entirely sure what we do about that, other than we have to educate our children differently and encourage girls to speak up encourage girls to take up space, room, and, you know, I always talk about agency, but to take agency, to take, you know, their seat at the table. I think a lot of women are guilty of waiting to be invited to the table, and unfortunately, you have to sit at the table, and you have to sit in discomfort. And that's not going to change anytime soon. The discomfort's going to be palpable. When you sit and demand a seat at the table, it feels excruciating but you must do it and we must encourage women to do it. And I think slowly it will change. But as I said, I mean, I consider myself second generation women at the table in terms of music. You know, this is early days still. And, you know, I, I look at the Me Too movement for a random example and it, it as sad as it makes me because it's, it's highlighted something monstrous. It's also taught a new generation behind us that you can use your voice, you can speak up, you don't have to tolerate being subjugated and and treated as an object. And, you know, yeah, I think we've got a long mountain to climb, unfortunately, but I think we're at the beginning of really changing, 
you know, how women are represented in our culture now. And, and I think that's exciting and I feel hopeful for the future and future generations that we will slowly eradicate the patriarchy to, to find a more egalitarian way of existing together amongst all the genders and all the sexes and all the strengths and weaknesses. It's what I hope for anyway. Unlike a Scottish person to be optimistic, but there you go. Oh, is he? <laughs> <laughs> um, did you meet Alice De Beer at the She Rocks thing? Did you meet any of the Fanny members? Like, talk to them? I didn't, sadly. I didn't. Oh, God, I'm no. She's one of my favorite humans on the oh, planet. Yeah, I was very yeah. taken with them. You know, I was ashamed. Yeah. I felt ashamed. I sat there going, I don't know anything about them. Yeah. Anything. Not, I didn't even recognize, there was no even name recognition. I had never heard of them in my life. It's okay. We'll take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this is just about gendered categories. How do you feel about the category women of rock or gendered categories in general? At this point, are they uh, helpful or hurtful, necessary, unnecessary? <coughs> I mean, I really do believe gender is completely over. You know, I think uh, these binary terms male and female have become almost obsolete at this point. I mean, I know that perhaps older generations and, and maybe a slightly more conservative leaning people will still struggle with that idea. But I, I really, really strongly see evidence and believe that the way we have thought of gender and sexuality is very uh, unevolved and again is, is, is changing and it's changing so fast. And that's one of the most beautiful things I've seen in my lifetime is how our perceptions of gender are slowly changing, even even as, as I live and breathe, you know. And I think it's exciting. And I, I'm, I, I've, I know a lot of my friends who have been trapped in, you know, gender roles that they that have nothing to do with who they are. And it's 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 a great tragedy to watch somebody unable to live their lives as who they are. I mean, it's, it's not right. And I'm, so I, I find the breakdown of, of all, you know, I love the term gender fluid. I think it's exciting. And I, I, I'm all for opening up any cage and letting us all merge as we see fit and where our hormones and, and our interests lead us. I, I'm all for it. How do you feel about your role in rock history? <laughs> Yeah, I, don't, I honestly don't think about it in those terms. I mean, I know that I'm playing a role just by being here, just by the fact that I've stuck around, you know, a long time at this point is unusual. And that's a strange realisation to come to, but I certainly don't think of it in any grand terms whatsoever. I just try and do good work and try and be a good human being and try and care about other people and you know, and are about our planet. I just want to, I do care. That's, again, I, that's maybe my greatest strength and my most tragic weakness. Is caring. Care, I care too much. <laughs> I just care too much. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, I mean, like I always say at the end, you know, you try to get the important parts of people's entire life in like an hour and a half to two hours. Um, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask you about? No, I think you've done a pretty extensive job. <laughs> I have to say one thing because I want this on camera for myself. You and Patty Schummel, I was born with a red afro. I was a ginger. It has just Ooh. changed color with age. One of the reasons <laughs> that you were on my wall is because you were like a cool ginger. Ging. I too was bullied and harassed. My nickname was Firebush. Mm. Um, like that's all over my ear. Oh, the most excruciating. And I want to thank you for being an awesome person and an awesome <laughs> ginger for like a lonely, isolated, big haired oh, ginger. You are. <laughs> it was my absolute pleasure to serve you. <laughs> thank you. Thank Bye. you so much.